CBS News, without any flowers in its hair, is in San Francisco because this city has gained the reputation of being the hippie capital of the world. I'm Harry Reasoner. We're asking whether any central idea unites the hippie colonies in this and other cities, whether they have anything to tell us, why there is so much emphasis on the use of the drug LSD in their philosophy. Those are our questions. We'll try now for the answers. By 1967, the countercultural movement of San Francisco's Haight-Ashbury district was beginning to draw national attention, its participants popularly known as hippies. At the heart of a youthful community experimenting with new approaches to society, politics, culture and the arts was its music scene. And of the bands that emerged from this milieu, it was the Grateful Dead that came to be regarded as its standard bearers. The thing to keep in mind about San Francisco is that it quickly became a kind of metaphoric place. It had been a hotbed of activity for the beats, and in the way that that transition from the beats into the hippies was a kind of crucial part of what happened in the 60s, in many ways San Francisco was the real locus of that. And to the degree that you can locate a center for the summer of love in America, San Francisco was it. You know, there was a sense that these bands not only were coming out and making interesting music, but they represented a kind of utopian vision of what hopefully could be. And the Grateful Dead were at the absolute heart of that. The Grateful Dead are playing a tune called, appropriately enough, Dancing in the Street. A pioneering improvisational act, the Grateful Dead were the most eclectic of all the San Francisco groups. Garcia uh, made for a great lead guitarist mostly because he came out of uh, bluegrass banjo. He had a very good conceptual idea of what single note lead could do. Phil Lesh wanted to you know, compose things for six orchestras with 120 players each. Weir was a strumming folky. Kreutzmann was a very good R&B drummer, played for a band that did a lot of James Brown. Pigpen was a straight-up blues guy whose model was Lightning Hopkins. So none of these things, at least in theory, meld together. Um, but in their own unique way, they did. The band's origins lay in the casual music circles of the Bay Area Peninsula, the breeding ground for most of the groups who later initiated the San Francisco scene and where, in the early 60s, a young resident of the city of Palo Alto, Jerry Garcia, was trying to make a name. There was a folk music scene on the peninsula about 40, 50 miles south of San Francisco that uh, gave rise to a whole bunch of great Bay Area musicians. Yorma Kalkinen of the Jefferson Airplane and Hot Tuna was part of that. Jerry Garcia was part of that. Um, I think the uh, Albin brothers, uh, Peter Albin and his brother Rodney were part of that. Back in 1961, when I was still in high school, my brother and a friend of his started a little club called Boar's Head in San Carlos, California. We had some of the local people performing on Friday nights and Saturday nights only, and it was a, a donation kind of thing. It was kind of like a coffee house, but with, without espresso. It just was just regular coffee, and people would put a dime in, and then people would get up on this little tiny stage and uh, sing a song or two. So my brother and I went down to Palo Alto. We understood that there were some people down there that played folk music and see if we could bring them up to uh, San Carlos. And one of them was Jerry Garcia. We had heard about him, and he was supposed to be a fantastic guitar player. So we went down there and we talked to him, and eventually we got him and some of his friends from Palo Alto to come to our uh, uh, weekly uh, weekend, I mean, uh, sessions up at the Boar's Head. Performing alongside Garcia at the Boar's Head were future Grateful Dead lyricist Robert Hunter and local guitarist Marshall Lester. Through Lester, Jerry had been introduced to bluegrass music and the Flat and Scruggs number Foggy Mountain Breakdown quickly inspired him to take up the banjo. He was a very good finger picker. He started playing five-string banjo and became extremely adept at playing five-string. 
Uh, I mean, to the point where you could play songs like Nola, you know, and, and uh, uh, Saints Go Marching In, but, but a lot of bluegrass stuff, a lot of Scruggs and Flat and Scruggs type uh, music. He also had a, uh, a desire to play the blues, so he had some blues friends. There was one guy named David McQueen, also Ron McKernan, a young kid from the area who played harmonica. He also played a little bit of guitar once in a while. They went through this folk music and blues and bluegrass kind of thing variously. Pigpen, uh, a.k.a. Ron McKernan, was the son of a R&B disc jockey who lived in that area and he was playing blues music. While Ron Pigpen McKernan and Jerry Garcia spent their time playing in a variety of folk and blues aggregations around the peninsula, another founding member of the Grateful Dead was undergoing a musical tuition that could not have been more dissimilar. As a classically trained musician, Phil Lesh had immersed himself in the formal study of music and together with future Dead bandmate Tom T.C. Constantin, he developed a particular interest in the serialist composers and the post-war avant-garde. It was by pure happenstance that I met Phil Lesh in 1961. We were both at Morrison Hall, the music building, to take an examination for entry into the music program there. And there was a break in the middle for lunch, and all of us prospective students assembled into the hall and uh, started congregating, and uh, pretty soon, uh, this blonde-haired fellow started saying certain things I found I was agreeing quite a bit with, and the way his story goes is he felt the same thing about me. Both of us found that we shared a very great enthusiasm for the European music that arose after World War II. Olivier Mézien, Pierre Boulez, Karl-Heinz Stockhausen, and Phil had been a volunteer at KPFA, the radio station in Berkeley, and consequently he had access to tapes of a lot of this music, which in 1961 was quite remarkable. It very little of it had been commercially released and was commercially available. There used to be a magazine called Horizon, and they had one essay on the newer music, and they had a printed example from Karl-Heinz Stockhausen's Klavierstück 11, his piano piece number 11. And I said, hey, that looks pretty wild and crazy. I think I'll go to the piano and try it out. And I found these wonderfully intricate crystalline sounds on the other side of dissonance. He had created this system of barbed hooks, as Herbert Eimert called it, rather like Webern, where it was so totally dissonant that the mind sort of readjusted. And it was like looking at modern art. And it was unpopular for the same reasons. But with a limited number of people, it was popular for the same reasons. In 1962, Lesh and Constantin's education was elevated by the arrival in California of modernist composer and Stockhausen associate Luciano Berrio. Berrio was due to teach a course in composition at Mills College in Oakland. Phil and TC were quick to enroll. Phil and I thought it had an air of the miraculous that a composer of the stature of a Luciano Berrio would be here to teach virtually in our own backyard. Berrio provided such a wonderful in the flesh example of what was possible to do with this kind of music. It was real, it was in your face, he was there, he could do it. And so, like they say about a picture being a thousand words, uh, a living in the flesh example is far more than that, and we just lapped it up. The diametrically opposed musical worlds of Lesh and Garcia finally collided that summer on the peninsula, as Phil traveled to a party attended by the various characters of the folk community. Phil and I went to the peninsula, Menlo Park specifically, and Phil introduced me to his friend Jerry Garcia, and a mutual admiration society on musical terms rapidly ensued. I wound up playing some of my avant-garde pieces for Jerry. Of course, his genius was already evident then. He's incredibly bright, not just musically. He would make comments on the times. He would have little trenchant observations to make hither and thither at any moment. Though they'd struck up a friendship, Garcia and Lesh found no immediate opportunities to work together. 
Jerry took up teaching guitar in Palo Alto and retained an intense interest in folk and traditional styles. By 1964, he had established a new group, playing jug band music together with Pigpen and one of his guitar students, Bob Weir. It was sort of an answer that the hipper young musicians had for the kind of sterility of popular folk music. You know, the Chad Mitchell Trio and the Kingston Trio and the, you know, the stuff that was on television was a fairly bland version of folk music and these guys wanted to get to the gnarlier stuff. Jug band music is basically string band, that is group blues. It's it really party music, it was dance music, and a lot of fun. And Jerry, Pigpen, and Bobby were in the jug band. Mother McCree's Uptown Jug Champions. And I, again, they had, they had an enormous amount of fun. It even caught on in a modest way uh, in, the, in the Palo Alto area. And a number of the songs they learned uh, for it, uh, for instance, Viola Lee Blues would become Grateful Dead songs. So it had an influence. The thing about jug band music was that it wasn't about proficiency. It was about being hip and having a good time and sort of being sardonic and, um, you know, ma making fun music for people that were not interested in what the mainstream, the button down kind of world of mainstream folk. Okay, downstairs at the tangent, and we're going to talk to one of the groups which performed tonight and is on the tape. This is Mother McCree's Uptown Jug Champions, and you are... Jerry Garcia. Uh, one question I think which many people have is, where uh, is music like this chosen? Uh, the a actual jug band music is uh, a sort of early blues band music that was recorded during the 20s and 30s. It's not sophisticated music. That is one of our major areas of uh, you know, what material, or one of our sources. Another is early Dixieland, well, you know, New Orleans jazz. Uh, we get some 1920, uh, 1930 popular music, and a lot of, not a lot of, but a certain amount of recent, more recent blues within the last 10 or 15 years. That includes some uh, very recent within the last three or four years rhythm and blues songs. Uh, these guys are just a panic to watch. They fumble around on the stage and they bicker and eventually they come out with some pretty weird music. I think you're in for a treat and a real thrill. So let's bring them on, Mother McCree's Uptown Jug Champions. Well now, she ain't got no... Oh no, she don't. I'm satisfied with my gal. From that jug band scene came the Warlocks, they decided to get electric and become more of an R&B band. One of the major influences at that moment, of course, was the Beatles in A Hard Day's Night. Money quote from Phil Lesh. I found myself the only guy in a room full of screaming chicks watching A Hard Day's Night and immediately started growing my hair long. The new band, The Warlocks, included Garcia, Pigpen, Bob Weir, local drummer Bill Kreutzmann, and Phil Lesh on bass. With the group configured, the Warlocks sought out opportunities to play in and around the Bay Area. They toured clubs, bars, and night spots, performing to largely disinterested audiences while they worked on finding their sound. It was a cover band, it was a bar band. They played with whoever paid, paid them, um, and they played current hits. They played uh, uh, The Love and Spoonful, Do You Believe in Magic? And they played uh, uh, Dylan, you know, Dylan songs and whatever. They covered. And then a little bit of blues. They sound exactly like the Beau Brummels and Question Mark and the Mysterian and all the other British invasion and British invasion influenced bands of the time. They had a, you know, they had a, the, the cheesy organ, they had a twangy, echo-laden guitar, and they had songs in these kind of minor modes and stuff.